Good morning. Today is the Sunday, the 1st of December. It's uh, about 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I'm in Ashburn, Virginia. This is Jay Waters. I'm with the Americans in Wartime Museum and the Voices of Freedom Project. Today it's my, my privilege to get to interview and meet with uh, William Bill Varell. Good morning. Good morning, Jay. Yeah, and if you would, just for the, for the record, if you could give us your, your full name and uh, your date of birth, please. Certainly. William Michael Varell, Sr., December 1958. And uh, where were you born? Uh, actually in Yonkers, New York. Okay. And uh, what, what war or conflict did you participate in? And if, if, if multiple ones, just tell us which ones. <laughs> okay. Um, in uniform, I participated in uh, Desert Storm as well as uh, Operation Joint Guard. Um, out of uniform, but still in direct support role for the forces I was in, OIF-1, OIF-2. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, also Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, as well as uh, some other activities in uh, Central Eastern Europe. Okay. Well, we can talk about as, as much of that as you want as well, and uh, maybe we'll just start chronologically. But, but I got a few more questions uh, before we get to that part. Um, so can you think back about your family, your, your parents or uncles, brothers, sisters, or even grandparents. Did you have other folks in your family that had served in the military before you? Yes, both my dad and my mom. Okay. My father did uh, the basic, what, two or three year stint in the early 1950s. And my mom, matter of fact, was a uh, uh, Air Force Reserve officer uh, in the nursing corps. Okay. And uh, d uh, how long was your mom? Oh, just a, a handful of years. Okay. I think it was the time when she was going to university. And any other relatives or great grandfathers or anybody? That no, oh, plenty of uncles were in um, the Second World War. Matter of fact, the uh, the twenty eighth division. Okay. Uh, I had family members serve in that. I had other family members serve Korea and Vietnam. Uh, mostly on my mom's side and a few on my father's side. Okay. So a strong uh, strong tradition of military. Without service. question, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well. Thinking back a little bit to uh, September 11th, 2001, the, the attack on America, if you would for a minute, think, of, think about where you were that day and uh, just kind of describe for us what was going on for you that day. I was uh, in San Antonio, Texas. I had retired there. Um, I was working for a, <laughs> pardon me, <clears throat> uh, Cummins uh, Diesel Engine Company. And uh, the morning of that event, uh, unbelievable shock and anger and uh, a sense of pride of those who were you know rescuing and and performing the first responder work I lost a uh, very good friend in uh, the Pentagon that morning mm -hmm. um, actually uh, three of them we I had served with and worked with intimately one of them was in uh, your career background uh, he was a three-star general by the name of Timothy Maud sure, yeah fantastic human being, honest, straightforward, excellent leader, and a, a classmate of mine at the Sergeant Major Academy at Parrish there, as well as a friend I had served with. He was uh, originally just a straight infantry fellow, but then he went into Special Forces. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a, a tough day. What, what, what was going on in San Antonio? What was the reaction of the community, or, the, or were there thoughts of the bigger picture, or did, did any of that, do you remember any of that? I, I can vividly recall getting contacted from the Knights of Columbus, I was a member, and uh, they said we need to start the fundraising, we need to get some relief money into New York and Washington. And uh, we went out there like like you normally see on the corner with the buckets and at the yeah. main intersection. And the t I, I, can't, I swear to you, that, that weekend we collected so much money. And of course the fire department folks had um, volunteer to yeah. travel east okay, there. Yeah, yeah. so we had to get a lot of folks from our Knights of Columbus team to backfill them as the first responder fire department yeah. <laughs> okay. medic guys yeah. Yeah. so uh, the sense of community came alive very quickly because you know we can only do so much right. with limited resource but the participation level was off the chart yeah, that's true. I remember that now too. The fire departments really from all over the country sent guys and equipment up there and then there would be the backfill requirements. The volunteers, yeah. 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 Um, well, Bill, why, why did you personally uh, decide to enter the military? I like that question. Um, here we go. I really wanted to be a Marine and I blame John Wayne, who was my childhood <laughs> idol. 
the Duke, everything about the Duke. Um, you know, patriotic, uh, loyalty, dedication. Uh, I, I went to the Marines and I did an interview with the recruiter and asked a couple questions. And I was intrigued by armor. You know, having seen Patton and the Bulge and all these other films multiple times, I felt, you know, maybe that might be a, an opportunity to do something different. No one in my family had ever done armor. And uh, I went to the Marines, spoke to the Marine recruiter. What did they say? Oh, yeah, we operate this type of a vehicle. And I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? That's an old vehicle. Even for somebody off the street, 17 yeah. years old, I understood that they were using older equipment. So I walk across to the next office and spoke with the Army, who said, yeah, we got the M60 series, and we're going to be filled on the M1 Abrams. Oh, lights out, done. Where do I sign? So... Uh, so the Marine Corps lost that on the here. Marine, oh, they're, they're to this day, I have so many close friends that are devil dogs, active and retired. Right. Um, their sense of uh, uh, camaraderie or uh, their unity of effort is, is unique. And it, it's very real. You know, it's, it's in their blood. They become so passionate to, to stay once a Marine, always a Marine. Uh, it's powerful. Yeah. Good folk. And was this, you were in high school at the time? Or just I was. Finishing up high school? I okay. was in high school. Okay. Um, it was in the mid-1970s. And so then you uh, en enlisted. Where did you go for your initial training? Uh, I enlisted uh, for armor, OSUT training, one station unit training, with my first assignment at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Oh, wow. But I went to uh, Fort Knox for the, uh, the armor school. Went through the, the M60 series uh, tank training, and then I was selected, well, not selected, but uh, by virtue of my en enlistment contract going to Fort Bragg, I had to go to another school for the Sheridan M551. And the Sheridan was an electronic disaster. Hmm. I mean, they took a naval six inch gun and put it inside a little tiny aluminum armored vehicle <laughs> that was amphibious, and you could drop it from the air, hence the 82nd. So I went to that school, did relatively well. I was actually the honor grad for that without trying. <laughs> but then I had to go to Fort uh, Benning to fall out of airplanes before you can go to Fort Bragg. Okay. So I did that loop, I get to Fort Bragg, and I was told, well, you're gonna have to be diverted. You're not, you're not, you can't be assigned here. And I'm like, what does that mean? I, you know, 18 years old, what do you know about being diverted? Uh, there was a, a significant shortage of armor crewmen in Europe. This is in the late 70s. So they took a package of us, put us on an airplane. Next thing you know, I'm landing in Frankfurt, Germany. And I'm like, what the heck? And I ended up on the 1st Armored Division. Okay. Um, and it was 1st Squadron, 1st Cavalry, which was a little outpost just southeast of Nuremberg. And we had uh, the, the border mission along the East German Czech border. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about that before we get into the, the Desert Storm. But, um, Certainly. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> to, you know, as a young person, Back then, we used to have those silly air raid uh, when I was small, and they were, they were terrifying. You know, you'd hear, you know, that, that siren, and you'd, you know, you'd think there's a jet coming that's going to unleash terror. So I always had an animosity towards the communist world. And then to be at a young age placed in a position of responsibility along that border, it, it taught a lot. Um, to be ready, uh, to be vigilant, and, you know, you know, the sense of compassion to those on the other side in conditions way, way beyond what folks are accustomed to. So it really impressed a lot upon me. And that, uh, that honestly, those three years on the border with First Armored um, pushed me to stay after my first enlistment. Yeah, because that was, that, after training, this was your, really your first real assignment. Where Correct. Where you day-to-day -day doing a routine and being Correct. with other soldiers. Correct. Any specific incidents stand out related to the border or, or anything for that matter? Oh, while you're definitely. Yeah, definitely. Share those, please. Um, I can't remember. It was in the, the late fall of uh, 79. A, uh, a small group of people tried to cross the border. Uh, there were a lot of fortifications, but in the Czechoslov East German section was very hard. They had towers constantly manned, they had uh, fences with munitions on the fence, and then munitions planted in between. Kind of like the movie with uh, Steve McQueen, the, the fences. And, oh, yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, but in the Czech sector, they, they didn't have as, enough, uh, as many resources, so there were some open, vulnerable areas. Okay. If they could get beyond the towers, 
So these uh, handful of folks, five or six of them, tried to cross over. Unfortunately, none, uh, only one made it. The other five were killed. Mm. And that was my first exposure to you know, enemy fire and tracer. I'm going, whoa, it is green. So <laughs> you actually a, saw this Oh, yes, incident. yes. Yeah, yeah we, we were doing our standard surveillance patrol back in the little 151 Jeeps, the World yeah, War II yeah, Jeeps, yeah, yeah. rickety little trucks. And uh, we, we were actually there to help that one uh, survivor and we immediately turned him into the, the German Customs and the uh, Federal Border Police. So we didn't, you know, we stepped away as quick as possible because we didn't want any international incident. Sure. The Americans were enticing or whatever they were trying to propagandize back then. We just helped the guy okay. turn him into the Germans. Well, where'd you go, where'd you go after Germany? I, I went to um, one of the best assignments that Army has at uh, Fort Carson, Colorado. Okay. <clears throat> And this becomes like a little bit of a Forrest Gump thing, if you will. <laughs> uh, I was assigned, at, while I was at 1-1 um, one -one Cav, I, uh, I moved fast, simply staying clean, doing what was right, and anticipating. And I got promoted extremely fast. I mean, I went from E1 to E4 in nine months, and a short time later, I was already a Sergeant E5. What happens now? They give you a tank. When the, you know, the rotation, yeah. the, the, you're the tank commander, get over there. So here I am, 21 years old, with uh, three other people. I'm responsible for their lives now, for their training, their morale. And um, fortunately, none of them were married. <laughs> so I didn't have any family members. Were you, were you married? Or I you was. I, I had actually gotten married. Okay. I had a young, uh, young baby girl at this point. So um, our tank was a, the, one of the, um, <laughs> the most unique experiences you could ask for. The tank was called the General Lee, okay? I grant you, the, the driver was from Tennessee, the gunner was from Georgia, and the loader was from Alabama, hence the General Lee. Yeah, and, uh, and you're from Yonkers, New York. <laughs> well, I didn't claim that. Yeah, yeah. I, I claimed Texas, but uh, long story short, the General Lee was the only uh, camouflage-painted vehicle in the entire squadron, and we were the display tank for every ceremony and also parades in the local economy. So I go to Fort Carson. I get assigned to an armor battalion there. And when I get to the company, I went to Cav Troop to a tank company, first time. And the Cav Troop, uh, the panache, the spree, it's just, it's there. Not as, not as tight as the Marine Corps, I'm not going to say that. But it's there. They, sure. they, they do it a little bit harder, a little bit faster. So we get there. <clears throat> And the, 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 the company commander, at first off, I looked at the equipment and it was really old, again. The, the frontline German stuff worked nice. We had brand new 60s, M60 tanks, I mean. You go to Fort Carson and these are really old M60s with lots of miles and hours on them. And I'm like, well, this is awkward. I want to go back to Germany. I started the paperwork. Let me get back to Germany. Anyway, um, I, um, the, the company commander and the first sergeant <clears throat> We're going to make me the commander's gunner. I'd already been a tank commander in Europe, on the border, conducting reforgers, conducting gunneries. Uh, no, I'm not going to be your gunner. That's a demotion. Okay? And I politely asked, I said, well, if there's no tanks available, may I please transfer to another company? I'd only been there a few hours. Not even a day, a few hours. The company, no, you're going to be my gunner. No, no thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a, it's a misuse of my capability. No, honest. Um, this went off <laughs> tail chase for a little bit. Finally says, we're going to go see the battalion commander's open door policy. Okay. So wait that afternoon, like 3.30 in the afternoon, you go over to the headquarters. I not met, I not met this gentleman. I didn't know anything about him. I'm, I'm just there. That, that was my introduction to that unit. And <clears throat> we go in to meet the guy. The company commander starts saying, you know, this young NCO is uh, being... Uh, arrogant and obstinate and this and that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He used those words, obstinate, obstinate and arrogant. That's a, that's a I word, remember yeah. those words. And I'm thinking, why am I being arrogant and obstinate? I just, the facts are the facts. I have an NCOER that says I was tank commander for this period of time. You don't go from a vehicle commander back down to the gunner seat. It's inappropriate. Unless you don't have the right leadership skills, which, yeah. okay, that's over time. You learn that. Battalion commander listens to him, looks at me, says, what's your story? I said, well, sir, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Several gunneries under my belt, border, or border missions, uh, reforger, where we engage against 
you maneuver against a lot of it was a big event back then it was huge it brought a lot of folks to to theater to do that exercise and we were successful and he looks at the company man he goes give the man a tank that was his word he just put the finger he goes give the man a tank that was wesley k clark okay the battalion yeah. commander <laughs> yep. at the time um we meet again later in our life in uniform but I get the tank, but I guess what kind of tank they gave me? I get the Hangar Queen. Yay! And it was a sad, sad sack. <laughs> it needed help. So fast forward a couple, that was like early, like in the winter, like February or March. So in the, the summertime, like around June, I'm in the turret. We just did a service, which is when you pull the engine, change the right. fluids, all that nonsense. And I had pulled out some of the components just as a precaution had them checked. They run a, the, 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 uh, the STI. So you remember those kits? The, the technical sure, yeah, plugs yeah, yeah. and all that? Yeah. Make sure they were working properly. And you bolt them back in. It's not hard. I'm all alone in the tank. It's hot for Carson summer. I got my coveralls on, but it, they're wrapped around my waist. I'm just wearing a t-shirt in the, in the turret. And I'm clunking around doing stuff. This image, a person, looms over the loader's hatch. I cannot see the person because of the glare of the sun. There's just somebody there who starts asking questions. Very polite, very articulate. And I said, okay, this is definitely a commissioned officer. Watch your tongue. <laughs> don't, don't, don't spew emotion. It's just, you know, it was a trigger yeah, yeah, in yeah. your head. Because if it was just another tanker coming in, hey, what are you doing with your, your dumb butt doing in there? Yeah. But this fellow was asking about logistics and, and parts and this maintenance working and this and that. And, this. and I'm, you know, okay, okay. I'm answering his questions as politely as I could goes on for a few minutes, like almost 10 minutes. And I climb up out of the TC hatch to, you know, ask if there's anything else. And I look, oh, he's wearing a one star. Yeah, yeah. Right? And we shake hands. And I said, anything else, sir? He goes, no. Said, Thank you, young man. That was Colin Powell. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he was a brand new uh, assistant division commander. Back then, you only had the two yeah, star yeah, right, and one star. Right, right. So he had recently arrived, and he saw this tank with the hatch open and the it was it was in distress essentially, you know, the gun tube up in the air and the doors are all open and the back engine. That was kind of interesting. He's walking the line, yeah. Yes. A few years later, just a few years, actually that was in eighty one. So eighty five, eighty six, I'm back with the second armored cavalry, back in Germany, second ACR on the border, third squadron, and one of the young platoon leaders in the troop is a young man by the name of Michael Powell, happened to be his son. Okay. Uh, Mike Powell, a uh, very fit, uh, athletic kid, outgoing, who's so much fun, uh, exuberant young man, a lot of, lot of fun. And um, he was a uh, second platoon. I was the, the first platoon, actually. I was the first platoon leader because I didn't have a lieutenant. Therefore, you know, sergeant first class, platoon leader. And then um, Mike Powell was second platoon, and then we had another little lieutenant down in third. So th these two lieutenants would always like do this number. Hey, what's the V-man doing over here? Because is that what they called you, the V-the V-man at the time? Yes. And uh, this is like 85, 86, and they're going, hey, "What's the V-man doing over there?" And I would be, you know, squeezing heads with my unit. I had a wonderful group of. Uh, there were no officers. It was just me and 35 other soldiers, uh, scouts, and tankers, and we had a uh, mortar vehicle. We had uh, 11 Charlie mortars. So uh, the platoon back then uh, was large, the number of vehicles, number of people, and I would always do the cross training. I had always embedded that from experience with 1-1 one, one Cav, you know, uh, not just being a tanker, you know, you're plodding around in your 50-ton thing. No, you need to know how to recon. You need to know how to get behind. Get that intel, give it, and then don't be engaged. Uh, move stealthily. So that, that transcended everything uh, that I ever, ever would do with a tank. The axiom, and it's, it's absolute precision. You can be seen, you can be hit. You can be hit, you can be killed. Don't be seen. How about that? Try that. I mean, with an M60 series tank with the signature of the big black plume of smoke when you goose the engine, it, it gives off a signature, sure, sure. you understand? Yeah. The big V12 diesel. Yeah, so you were, you were ta talking about how be, you know, if you're seen, you can be shot at, and if you're shot at, you could be killed. So Indeed. Probably, probably good lessons for your, your soldiers. You can quickly identify those that are serious about their business, who are... I, I used to say this one expression as I uh, increased in, in the responsibility. I would ask these kids, uh, so how many lives you got? When they become a little bit obtuse, let's say. 
You know, they didn't like the way we were training. They didn't, ex they didn't like the length of time involved. They figured it should have been over four o'clock so we can go drink beer. Uh-uh, no. We're on the border. There are wrong people on the other side that want to do bad to this side. In order to stop them or slow them down, we need to train as hard as we can every chance we can. Right. You don't half step it or goof. So I would ask that question, how many lives you got? Oh, I got one life. Right. You want to trade it? You want to lose it? No, Sarge. Okay. Yeah, this, this was works. still in the late, late mid-80s, mid 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 Reagan, cold, cold war oh, big time, big you know. time. Yeah. Uh, we had, we had uh, you know, a lot of Ron Bow influence at this point. I got to go back just a little bit, though. After Carson, uh, while at Carson, I had um, done something that no one had done for that unit, so I became the little shiny object for Wesley K. Uh, they have a, an organization similar to, like, the Morales Club in Europe, or the Artie Murphy with the third ID. They called the Iron Horse Club. Okay. Fourth ID. So I was the first NCO to ever become a member of the Iron Horse for that battalion, at least during Clark's time. And it was kind of prestigious. You got your own parking spot next to the commanding general. Oh, wow. and Oh, it was a big ceremony, Iron Horse Club thing. And then I went to uh, uh, BNOC, Basic Non-Commissioned Officer course. I came out the honor grad for that. And I'm not, I'm not boasting here. It's just, it happened. It's a fact. Yeah. It just happened. Uh, I was fortunate, you know, I, I studied, I didn't like the instructors, I'm going to grant that. I do remember they were, they were really, really, really focused in what I thought was administrivia versus tactics. Hence, I, got, I didn't get the cleanest bunk, but when we did do our maneuver, when we did do our planning, when we did, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> so it happened. So with that, uh, I kind of ingratiated myself with uh, Wesley K. So I had, I had um, requested reassignment to Europe. Orders came in. I was only there about a year, a little over a year. And the orders came in, and I'm going to Kirchgoins, Germany. I'm going to Elvis's unit. Who, how cool is that? I'm going to yeah. go to 32nd Armor, Elvis. I was a big Elvis fan. Rock and roll. So <laughs> I'm all psyched. I'm going to go back to Germany. Uh, and then I get this little postcard, like a little 3x5 postcard, official. You, congratulations, you've been selected to go to drill sergeant school, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Oh. I'm like, no, you, no. I went to the command sergeant major, who was also fond of me for doing the B-knock and the Morales. I said, sergeant major, please. He goes, no, lad, that's, that's where you belong. He called me lad. I remember him, sergeant major Anderson, very polite gentleman. Uh, so I didn't want to go to Fort Knox. Was this your first assignment to the, the institutional or training yes, base? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. And you were a staff sergeant, sergeant oh, first class? I, I had just made staff sergeant. Okay, yeah. Super fast yeah. for that time, like four years and a few months. So. Yeah, I think part of the, the doctrine, or even now, though, was let's get some of our best and brightest from the tactical force into the training base. Oh, without question. Base, so. uh, the, that, that theory did apply later. Yeah. Well, how did, how did that go for you? How was your adjustment to the training base? Um, I was very blessed to serve because that also put me into a whole new category and a different uh, direction or paradigm. Uh, I w immediately was assigned to an Abrams unit. Okay. The only Abrams okay. unit. So I had become, you know, from an M60 guy, I had to learn the, the, M the M1 pretty quick. And for the for people listening now, the Abrams was the latest and greatest. It was not the, the it most advanced just tank. being fielded. Yeah, yeah. It was only fielded in a few locations. So looking for the best soldiers and, and people, best unit to run that new equipment, essentially. Well, uh, if I may, just uh, we were the, the the foundational training footprint for the M1 uh, right, tankers. Right. So the the unit was uh, Charlie Company, First Battalion, First Brigade, Fort Knox, and. I get there, and they had already completed, I think, two, cycle, two cycles. It's a 14-week course. Um, the, the soldiers are immersed in the vehicle on day five, literally. You know, like in basic training, straight basic training for infantry and other uh, MOSs, you don't get to play with weapons and tactics on day five. It's a little bit different. But because of the complexities of that vehicle, and they had to learn to be the driver, the loader, and the gunner. And then, of course, maintenance and other aspects. So I became a, uh, a drill sergeant for M1 uh, so troops. That was in the fall of uh, 82. And then on the, at the uh, beginning of 1983, like January, uh, they opened up a second company, Bravo 1-1. And I was transferred into that as, as a uh, 
a fresh drill sergeant M1 trained, which is more like this is another Forrest Gump moment. Mm -hmm. The uh, the company first sergeant was a, a very robust NCO, Vietnam veteran. Most of the NCOs still at this point had you know a Vietnam. I got to share that too as well. But uh, this this particular NCO, we had been an extra in Stripes just not long. Not long before, oh, wow. like, like yeah. a year the, or two. The, the, the movie, the movie right. with yeah. Bill Murray and the oh, wow. goof and running through the yeah. woods, all that nonsense. So he had been <laughs> one of the drill sergeants marching his Joes around when the film is going. Yeah. And we used to tease him. Um, well, I started it because of my nature. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Uh, in the in the movie, they have the Hulka Burger franchise. The, the big toe, yeah. And, and Sergeant Hulka, yeah, but yeah. He, when he retires, he opens up the Hulka Burger yes, franchise. Yes, yeah. So I would tease the first one. I said, so when you retire, you can open up your own burgers. And then he'd give me that. He pushed it, young man. And uh, his name is Jack Tilly. He's a friend of mine to this day, who was Sergeant Major of the Army. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A few yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, sure. Wonderful human being. One of the most articulate and... Crafty NCOs. I say crafty because no obstacle, no obstacle exists. No obstacle exists. You're going to bypass it or we will breach. And, and I love this mentality. And he took care of Joe. He took care of the troops. Yeah. Really is a superb leader. So we, we, we spent time together later in our career. Did there ever become a uh, Tilly Burger chain? I don't recall. I, I asked that. him. I know. He's down in Florida too. Should but uh, he, he did do something uh, a few years back, similar to like uh, American Idol with the soldiers, where they did the talent and the singing okay. and yeah, the, yeah. all that. I think I heard about that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Jack Tilly was behind that. He's a great, he's just a superb human. So we go to Europe, get back on the border, 2nd Armored Cavalry. I re-enlisted for that position. And all the other drill sergeants I was working with gave me this like, you got a screw loose, don't you? Like, what are you talking about? You don't come off the hat and then go out to the field like that. Uh, why not? Why? It, it, here's my point. Most of the folks that do drill stat, three years on a hat is hard. I'm just going to share that. Um, there were times where I had I would go weeks, seven days at a time, for four or five weeks before you get into break. Yeah. yeah. I'm not complaining. It was the nature of the job. We we were short of qualified drill sergeants. And speaking of which, Jack Tilly had asked me to become a tank commander at the same time as I was a drill sergeant. Mm -hmm. So where did that happen? I trained my platoon, and then we would get into the motor pool, and I would take my drill sergeant hat off, climb inside the, the tank, and I would teach tank, which was kind of unique. And that was very special for me because yeah. that helped me stay sharp. Yeah. But the the, the appreciation that the, the that my trainees, you know, you got thirty two to thirty five young human beings, and I used to tell them, I said, every day we're going to be building a fence. We're going to build the fence every day. Some days the slats are going to be vertical and perfectly spaced. Other days they're going to be crooked and drooping and ugly. So don't worry about it. We'll start over. I said, if, I, if, I, if you feel like I'm, you know, I'm pushing you too hard, it's, there's a purpose for this. Okay? Um, I still have, to this day, a stack of those little pocket photos. And they're signed by the troops. Wow. Yeah. To, the, to, the, you know, to the best drill sergeant in the world. Thank you for making me a, yeah. a soldier and all, you know. I would never have done this without you. Know, yeah, yeah. Humbling, humbling. But what I will share with you, Jay, I have Facebook friends that were my trainees okay. who advanced in their military careers as well up into you know, the senior level, first sergeant and or sergeant major. So that's, that's incredibly gratifying. That's your job, yeah. create your legacy with good, good folk. Well, did this drill sergeant assignment for three years, as you said, yes. did it did it change your your perspective? You said about tactics versus administration, or did you still have the the same the tactics versus administration? You made that comment earlier. Yes. Then having three years on the other side of the fence, did you have a different appreciation uh, for the administrative side of the army, or are you still more tactics, tactics, tactics? Definitely tactics oriented. Okay. That's fair. Thank you. Um, but they got they got me in the end. <laughs> I had to serve at the Department of the Army for three years in the Armor Branch, another great job. So we go back to the border, we're doing our thing, uh, wonderful, it's gung-ho, we're out in front, we're doing it. And the second ECR of all units uh, demonstrated some of the, uh, the most professional and dedicated, loyal you know, leaders that I could ever find, for any level, at the platoon, the troop, the squadron. Regimental commander, regimental sergeant major, all these folks were just a cut above, and it was so gratifying to be in that. And it, it, 
push you a little harder to, to maintain that edge. I still have many friends to this day. We were platoon sergeants at the same time, and then we moved up to the first sergeants within there, and then... Um, well, what year do you think this was now that you're back with, or you're back in Germany and you're with 2nd ACR? What, uh, what year? It was 85, was summer 85. of 85. Okay. okay. I was there till uh, November or December of 91. So it was, I did an extended tour there. Okay, so that included your, your Desert Storm. Yes. Time. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. So, so let's talk about that for a second. Okay. Um, so if I'm going off a of memory here, but so like basically August of, of 1990, mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. Do you remember hearing about that? And what were Very your, much What so. were your initial thoughts about that? Um, I don't want to make, make, make a mess here. Um, we, 2nd ACR, still what we're transitioning from doing because of the border in 89, when the wall fell, you know, we, we were involved with that heavily, you know, helping the resettlement and all that nonsense. So our, our mission had, had changed significantly, and we were, we were caught in a, in a void. We started training a little harder. Um, our leadership took initiative. I'll give them so much credit. Thinking forward, you know, okay, we need to understand, you know, movement uh, at speed in, in the open terrain, which you don't do in Europe. You just don't right. do it. You can't. Right. There's just not enough ground to spread out the unit. And then, then we also, this is again in the fall, like you said, the late summer of 90. So we had the conversations. Uh, we didn't have actually, you know, the resources to do it, but the, the, the mindset had, had been planted. How are we gonna operate in a wide open area? Um, I'd, I'd like to go back just a little bit to about a year or so prior, maybe two. Uh, I did my time with second ACR. I did a complete three year tour. And then uh, back then they had, uh, in Europe, you may remember, they had this uh, where you could do uh, a three, another three years and they would give you a 30 day um, free vacation or whatever it was. Yeah, I think it was called the In Place Consecutive Overseas yes. Tour, the IPCOT. IPCOT, thank you. Yeah. I forget the term. So well, I'm a personnel guy, so yes, I knew all that. Smart man. So we took the, I took that yeah, mission the and then- Yeah, 30 days of free leave. And yes. It's and an airline it, ticket too. It was right? free flight to the States, I think, for you yeah. and your family, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. And I had uh, asked uh, the reg I was working at the regimental border ops at this time. This is in uh, early summer, mid summer of '88, and there, there was just no cav platoon for me to operate from. However, First Armored was just up the street from Nuremberg in Erlangen, and I'd always, you know, First Armored. It was my first unit of assignment. Yeah, I can do this. I asked. I got assigned to uh, what was then uh, 281 Armored in uh, First Armored Division, uh, 2nd Brigade, Erlangen, which at the time, the, the free world's largest armored brigade. We had three, three tank battalions, mech infantry and self-propelled artillery. It was a huge organization. The brigade commander, very, very sharp gentleman by the name of Jack Moncastle, member of 2nd ACR, Cav, quick, sharp, push. They, go to this armor unit, brand new M1A1s. These tanks only had like six hours on them. They were really brand new. So that wonderful smell, clean, pristine vehicles. And the mentality of these soldiers, and we're in Europe and it was so confusing. Hey, there's still bad people over there, okay? This is in 88. Uh, it reminded me like of the Carson time where they were just methodical, not, not aggressive. I didn't like that, so I inserted myself and we pushed. And they, they trained and got better. Night gunnery, December of 88. As you know, you do your, your day run, night run, you have an AR. The, the quickness of the, of the event, the, the, that, that whole aspect, I, I was disappointed in the crew. They, they did okay, but it wasn't where it should have been. So after the, uh, the NCO uh, evaluator gave his talk, I had a few minutes with the guys in the tent. It was cold, it was dark, it was late. And you know, I, told, you know, I went back to the, how many lives you got? You really think you did well enough to survive if there were other people popping caps your way? The no, no, Sergeant, you know, the, okay. Do it right the first time or don't do it at all. Think about that. What an easy philosophy. I didn't know, but Montcastle was in the back of the tent. Oh. He snuck in yeah. and was listening. A few months later, like uh, March, we were designated to provide, this was an INF thing, an International Nuclear 
Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The Ronald Reagan, with Gorbachev. Okay, we're going to watch Ukraine. The Czechs, the Czechs. No, no, no. no not, the, not the Czechoslovakians, but the checking of each other's yes. countries. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. they yeah. physically yeah. would watch us train. We would go there and watch them train. Yeah. So the mission, the task came down for an articulate, physically fit, such and such, Master Gunner, E7, 19 kilo, to do this briefing for the Soviet land forces, four star, who gets tagged. Yeah. So here's where Beetlejuice really comes to life. <laughs> I can share with you. My, my brigade commander, or well, he received, the, he told me he received the, uh, the director directly from General Franks. He says, this NCO has to be, you know, he wanted the, the cream of the crop, pristine, sharp, quick, all that nonsense, plus somebody with a little bit of experience to back it up. So I could pull this, and this is way before PowerPoint. You know how we had to operate back then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The big flip chart. Butcher blocks. Butcher blocks. Um, Stencils. Yeah. Stencils. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And measurements yeah. and precision yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. level. You didn't level on the paper, so you make, anyway. So the exercise was Tank Table 12, which is the platoon battle run. Four tanks in the defense destroy a Soviet motorized rifle battalion in the offense. So four tanks against 40 targets. And guess what? You get 10 bullets per tank. Only get 40 rounds. And you get a handful of uh, small arms machine gun for troops. It's a really, really good challenge for a platoon. And the, the, the timing and the precision and the coordination and of course the reporting. Anyway. We go out there, we start to re, uh, you know, go to the Grafenvir, we're going to do the rehearsal. Got the butcher chart there, I'm all ready to do my thing in front of General Franks and the other officers of the brigades, the whole division staff. And I look him in the eye, I said, hey, sir, is, you know, how do I say this? How do I explain what's going on? And I'm going to have to share with you, he said a, a four-letter word here. <laughs> it's okay for me. Thank you. He, I said, you know, how do I explain this? And he looks at me, and you know how he is. He's like, cocks his head and goes, you just tell him it's their shit. I got it, sir. That's how he said it. I got it. So that made it a lot easier for me to do my, yeah, my sure, briefing. Sure, We get through that. First brigade, I'm second brigade. That was still the rehearsal, though. This was the very first rehearsal mm -hmm. at the tower. The first brigade commander, I can't remember the gentleman's name. He was a good colonel, sharp. He said, sir, you know, I, I've got a problem with this. He said, what do you mean? He says, my, my brigade is going to have operational control of this range at that point, which was happening in a couple months, June. June. And the old man scratches his head. And, yeah, you're right about that. He says, uh, how, how sharp is your master guard? He was a good guy. He's a friend of mine today. We still email once in a while. And, uh, you know, he's extremely sharp. Okay, yeah, you're right. You guy gets to brief it. Jack Moncastle says, but he's going to shoot it. My platoon. Yeah, the other guy. <laughs> my brigade yeah, commander yeah, yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. Oh. Said, I'm, my platoon gets to shoot oh, it. Oh, okay. So I'm like, no, I thought I was out of the business of the dog and pony. Nobody yeah, wants yeah, yeah. to be in that. Not true. You're going to fire this thing. Oh, okay. Nobody wants to stay long for dog and pony show at gunnery because the risks are really high to see if you're good or you're not so good. You understand? Mm -hmm. um, so we were privileged. I was in Bravo, one, uh, 281 at the time, and we turned into 470 armor. Anyway, we, got, we were, you know, at the time they let us do the, uh, the names on the vehicles, the board evacuator and a little sign at the back of the turret. And I was Beastmaster and Battle Wagon, oh, very lame. And I, I, I chose Beetlejuice from the movie because... I just like the movie and the name. <laughs> so Beetlejuice was the name of your, your tank. Uh, my, our tank was Beetlejuice. So that's how the, the name, your nickname even now is Beetlejuice. Yes. It, it it's, goes it's, back to the movie and then your, your tank was called exactly. Beetlejuice. Exactly, yes. Well, so how did the, uh, the briefing and then the gunnery actually go? Um, so the, the crew resisted the name so much. They're like, come on, Sarge, that's a silly, that's lame. I said, no, Beastmaster is lame. How many times have you seen Beastmaster on a gun tube? A lot. How many times have you seen Beetlejuice? You're never. Okay, cool. Done. So, we have to rehearse the event because the, the briefing was scheduled for 20 minutes to introduce, you know, the entire, the technical aspects of four tanks, destroying 40 in the, in the offense, la, 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 all the military jargon. So, we had to rehearse our movement. So, in, in this event, uh, event, the four tanks 
uh, start the fight in the forward fighting positions. And the targets will appear at a good distance, well over 3,000 meters. And when the targets appear, as, as per doctrine, order of battle, all that, we, we call indirect fire. And it's live indirect fire, but it's pre-positioned in the, the computers of the guns, so we're not adjusting it. So they fire this white phosphorus artillery, which in theory turns the enemy movement because they can't go the other way, there's water. They have to turn left or come towards us. So the targets will appear and the terrain is rolling, so you'll see a couple, three, four, five. It's very well choreographed range. Uh, again, we have 10 bullets per tank. Tanks are numbered one, two, three, and four. I gave the fire command uh, two round Sabo direct front alternating. So what that gave us was when the one in the three tank would pull the trigger and shoot, the two in the four tank are scanning exactly where the, because we understand orientation from our reference points. So you're not going to duplicate that target, which is what you don't want to do because you got to kill all 40. Um, and you get to tell the other guy it was a hit very quickly. You know, you can sense for them. The term. So we, we start the engagement a little bit deeper than uh, doctrine. Doctrine puts it right at uh, 15 to 1800 meters as the kill zone. And I, I actually started our kill zone right at 3000. Well, you open fire at 3000 meters, which is just under two miles. Seriously. Mm -hmm. um, the projectile at the time, it's still to this day, the Sabo projectile, I got one over there, I'll show you. Um, 1640 plus meters a second. So it's a mile a second bullet. If you do everything right, as you should, and your system's tight, you're going to hit that target. And you're in a defense, you're not even moving, so it's like laying your weapon against sandbags. Very lethal. <laughs> we, we fire the engagement, tanks pull back, they scream, they slide up into the positions, we get ready to do our thing, and the last few rounds we fire using the alternating technique again, so the odd number tanks both would come up on these concrete pads, and they would like slide into the fighting position, pull the trigger, bam, slide back down. Immediately the even number tank is coming up doing the opposite. So you have like these giant fists going wham, mm -hmm. wham. It, it, it's loud and it's impressive and targets are falling. And what is the actual target? What, what are you hitting? Uh, we're hitting uh, silhouettes of uh, BMPs, uh, other uh, command and control vehicles, and of course tanks. So the frontals are showing. But they're, they're actually, they're moving, of course. No, no, only a few move. Uh, and they move on an oblique, like they're running away. A railroad track? Kind yes, of thing indeed. They're, yeah. they're built into uh, the range. The range is designed yeah. explicitly for this challenge. So we hit 39 out of 40 that day, which is unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. Very hard to do. Because they're only exposed for a few seconds, yeah. like six or eight seconds. Because, you know, the, the impression of they're hiding behind the terrain popping up. We missed, we missed the mover, the fast mover at the end, because, I mean, the, the tracer was right over the back deck, you could see. It was close, but it's a very small target, and he's moving in an oblique at 30 miles an hour, so it's a little hard shot. But what happened in the tower, I forgot to share this, um, when you say dog and pony show, uh, there hasn't been a dog and pony show like that in a long time. 16 Soviet general officers, starting with a four-star, who was their chief of land forces. He was a, a veteran of Stalingrad. He had been wounded as a young uh, soldier. And 16 American, four star, four star, three star, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The four star, uh, USERA commander, uh, Crosby Saint. Mm -hmm. uh, with him was a good friend of mine to this day, Mr. Command Sergeant Major Retired George Horvath. So George was in the tower too. So he, he shared his, his sentiment with me when he saw what happened. The translators, the poor guys, there were two of them that were, you know, doing all the translation from the briefing and the engagements. And one of the points I have to note, I have to note, they disputed the fact that my friend, Sergeant First Class, M1 Master Gunner, was a Sergeant First Class. They said, no, he's a Lieutenant Colonel. Maybe a Major, but a Lieutenant Colonel. Because nobody's that articulate, that knowledge. That was the guy that gave the actual brief. He was the NCO, yeah. You were doing the, the gunner. Well, we were shooting. Gunner, gunner, yeah. the, the Russian officers disputed that he was an NCO. He's too smart. He's too sharp. No, Holmes. This is what we do. And, 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 then, and then, of course, we hit all those targets, and they're spazzing. They're just, what is going on? They were in total shock and awe. I mean, 
he told me, my, my friend, the master gunner said, dude, there were 16 divots in the floor from the Russians at the speed and the lethality. And then you had 16 American generals going, and my boys, just like Garfield. But the poor translators, they couldn't translate my call sign. And they kept focusing on my tank. It's gotta be a special weapon. That's a different, that's a, oh, that's a, how do you take an insect and a beverage and translate it? Right. And they hate, it was the most fun. Yeah. They were just concerned about, what's a Beetlejuice? What's a Beetlejuice? Oh, oh, oh. It's top, <laughs> top secret weapon system, the Americans are coming Just up a with. happy, goofy call sign. Yeah, yeah, wow. Heck of a day. Well, so getting into the, the desert storm time. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the Iraqis have invaded, it's I think August. Yes. Um, what was the reaction at the unit when that word reached back to you guys? Was there any any direct connection that, hey, we might be involved in that? Or was that just like, hey, no big deal? Well, back then the standard was, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, to have a presence, obviously a reactionary presence. So they, when they pushed the uh, 82nd over there, and then they pulled the 3rd ACR in quickly as well, which is uh, armored, right. our sister. They matched us vehicle for vehicle. When they brought them in, which was a few weeks later, uh, that's, that started to make us more aware. But the initial thing was, mm, okay, how are we going to train and maneuver here if we have to go there? So we, we had a little bit of a concept, but nothing specific. Fast forward to November of that year, and again, uh, the 9th of November. And in <laughs> the 9th of November, 89, wall came down. The 9th of November, 90, uh, we get alerted to deploy. I was in a promotion board with the other first sergeants and sergeant major. We had a wonderful command sergeant major. He was very friendly, good man. So you, so you were a first sergeant. I was captured Troop first sergeant. Yeah. Uh, Eagle Troop, second squadron. Okay. That's a whole story by itself with HR and the previous first sergeant. And oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I was actually going to be the Ghost Troop first sergeant when that first sergeant PCS'd. So I was in Ghost Troop, serving as a platoon sergeant for a few months until you know, the normal transition time, and I would take uh, reins as a first sergeant ghost. A few weeks, uh, right after the 4 November, or 4 August announcement and all the invasion nonsense, like a week or 10 days, my, my friend, the ghost troop first sergeant, who I'd known forever, we were on drill status together, he calls me up and says, hey, Sergeant Major wants to see you tomorrow morning at 8.30, be sharp. I'm like, what? Yeah, he wants to talk to you. Okay. I had no idea anything more than that. I showed up a few minutes earlier, like proper, track. He goes, you ready to take over? Uh, and I was confused, and totally, I didn't know what he meant in any way, shape, or form. He asked, uh, you ready to take over as first sergeant? I said, um, yes, Sergeant Major. However, uh, what happened, why did my, my, my friend, you know, is he, is he in jeopardy or did he do something wrong? And he, he was confused. He didn't know that it was a different troop. Or he, he didn't know that yeah, I realized. Because okay. I was focused on ghost troop becoming the first sergeant with them. He says, no, you're going to Eagle. And I'm like, nah, I don't want to go to Eagle. I'm going to go to Ghost. Mm. <laughs> because at the time, Eagle was in a little bit of disarray. HR had become the troop commander and jumped in both feet. And uh, the, uh, the current, for, or the, the first sergeant at that moment when they relieved had a little bit of a bottle problem. So uh, he made the call. And HR had gone to the CSM and the, the squadron commander goes, he said, I want this. Well, who, who's HR? What HR McMaster. Okay, yeah. He said, uh, yeah, I want Varel. I need him. Because we had known each other for a while, right, right, working right. at regiment, yep. in the regimental uh, staff. And we butted heads, and, and I just liked the guy. He was very aggressive, gung-ho. And I get, to the, I get to the troop, and he's like a cat pacing. He's all flushed. He goes, Bill, man, I had to fire your other guy. We're in a mess. I need your help. And then we just dove in. That was, it was humbling and, and right. exciting, but I was also... Uh, Okay, so well, so, so please. So, so, so now you're a you're a first sergeant of a of a, a cap troop. Yes, getting ready to deploy into into or now you're in Kuwait, right? No, not yet. No. Well, let's you, but let's you maybe jump forward to now uh, the the actual deployment movement from Germany to okay, uh, sure. into into either Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. That was an incredible adventure. Incredible adventure. Um, we had learned our lesson, or the army had uh, learned the lesson, uh, not to repeat what happened to the. Uh, the infantry unit that had had that terrible tragedy in Newfoundland, remember? The whole the whole battalion right. lost everything. So they did this cross 
pollination. Leader from this unit went with that unit. Leader from that unit went with that. So shell game. So we land there in, in separate aircraft. So HR and, and a couple others are in a different yeah, Where did flight. you actually land? We landed in um, uh, Al Jubail, Saudi Arabia, which is where they have a, the world's largest at the time. It was a BP um, refinery. This place was enormous. Mm -hmm. And what did you do for the first probably month or two? Oh, right? no. Re receive equipment and... It was like, we were so blessed. We, Second Squadron, Second Armored Cavalry was the very front of everything Seventh Corps. So our boat or ship with the equipment was docking. They okay. gave us the, we flew as the boat was docking. The very next morning, we get up and we're still in jet lag and all that. We're going to the pier to take our stuff off the boat. So we were so blessed with that. Grab the kit, bring it out to the, uh, the intermediate staging ISA thing and start painting it. So, and I swear, um, I still have the videos. I have the little VHS videos. HR and the platoon sergeants and the platoon leaders are operating, doing tactics on the floor of the tent. There's nothing, it's just dirt in the tent. They're lining up the unit, how we're gonna maneuver in, this, in the real desert. Because uh, the expanse, it was, you know, it was enormous to go from you know, Germany with villages and wood lines and hills and all that ap apparatus to dirt and sky, literally just dirt and sky. No vegetation, no man-made, nothing, no power lines. So we, we were able to get our equipment off the boats quickly. Uh, incredible adventure, getting it out to the place. Then they put us on uh, the flatbed trucks from hell. <laughs> These non-English speaking drivers who do what they want. On the great Saudi Arabian road network as well. On Tapline Road. Yep. The only road, two lane yeah. thing. We go out to the thing, get everybody set up in our first assembly area. And we trained so hard, it's incredible. We had nothing else to do, we're gonna train. So this is probably now late November, December no, of 90? We, we flew on the 4th of, we, of, of December. December, okay. We collected the vehicles on the night of the 5th, the very next day, and we had get everything painted. We were moving like the 10th or 12th. It was less than a week. December, okay. Of December, yes. Okay. Oh, but another Fred Frank story. Okay. As we were the only unit, and he, he showed up on the 6th, the morning of the 6th, I will say. Yes, yeah, 6th December. He flies in, a couple of Blackhawks, you know, they come in. We have our vehicles in a big sloppy line. All the back, all the ramps are down. People are pulling out their kit, getting reorganized, stowing equipment, ammo, all that. And he walk, he troops the line. He walks through every vehicle, talking to every person. He's Seventh Corps commander at this point. And my 113 is the first sergeant. I was all the way to the end of everything, along with the, the, the Humvees we had. And he sees me and he walks up and he goes, how you doing? I, you know, he says, what can I do for it? What can I do? I said, please, sir, give us a mission. Don't bog us down. Please, let us just do what we're supposed to. He goes, I can handle that. He shook hands. He walks away. It's Fred Franks, three yeah, star. Sure. You know how he is. He's, yeah. he's not a very physically imposing guy, but when you look in those eyes, they're so much, the, the gears are just constantly moving, you know? Fast forward, March, early March, 91. We're now located just north on the bluffs north of Kuwait City. You have Mad Max Boulevard in full view. You know, the highway where everything right. got smoked. He, our, our second ACR had uh, Marshal just, just west of Highway 80, which runs north to Iraq from Kuwait City. And all the oil field fires are glistening to the east. You never got misoriented. Right. Fires east, good. Uh, he flies in, he wants to talk to uh, the troops. He trudges over, get the little huddle, we start talking, yet does his interaction, tells us we're the greatest thing since sliced bread, we're going home first, all this, yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. And he looks at me, he goes, I kept my word, didn't I? I Can you believe yeah. that? He yeah, looked me right in the eye. So, well, so think about, you know, the, um, the air campaign that started, you guys are in your staging area, but now the ground war has started. What was your, your role? Not so much the big unit, but your particular um, uh, troop, and, and what did you guys do on the ground offensive? Okay. Uh, the squadron formation was a diamond, if you will, with a, a cavalry troop in lead, and two cavalry troops on the flank, and um, the tank company, we had 14 M1s, 
uh, in, at uh, 6 o'clock, if you will, 12 to 6. And in the center was uh, the squadron commander and the ops, the three and a couple other vehicles. And tucked in behind each of the flank wing uh, troops, we had uh, four howitzers, because we had a howitzer battery mobile guns. Sure. So we had four guns mm -hmm. behind us and four. So we had Fox Troop in the lead. We were on the left, Ghost on the right, H Company in the rear. And we moved like that for several days. We crossed the berm like that. Fox went first, we were left. And what was it like going across the berm? What do you remember from that? I remember an, a, a significant artillery barrage because there were some observation points. They were like sand castle hut things, really strange looking in the middle of the desert. We hadn't seen any buildings forever. But, uh, but it was like two or three o'clock in the morning. No, we were 1400. Oh, okay. We, we, that was we went a day prior to everybody else. Yeah, okay. We okay. moved on the 23rd. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, and we only went like 20 kilometers into Iraq. So the engineers cut the holes after yeah. the artillery and they were quick, the, the, the little vehicles did a great job. Tanks went through, spraying with machine guns. A couple heat rounds went off because uh, there were still some like bunker complexes. Uh, ignited all that, we moved forward. And so you did receive some Iraqi resistance? They were, there was stuff out there, yes. Yeah. They were, I think they were shocked. I know they, they were shocked that, oh, it's really happening, okay? And again, it was just 2nd Armored Cavalry slicing through in front of 7th Corps. And then we set up this, I want to say it was about 20 kilometer wide, because we had three squadrons and all this other stuff, uh, front, and then we pulled security. And we, we stayed up, we did brief resupply. <clears throat> the following morning is when all the, the armored divisions okay. and 1st ID, when they punched through yeah. early, early. Okay. Well, then just talk us through, they, they call it the 100 hour war, so yes. to speak. So just talk us through the next, hundred hours or so, what, Certainly. What, what you and your unit did. Thank you. The very next day, it started to rain. Um, it, it does rain a lot there. So it was, I guess, one of the more uh, precipitation that it had in like a hundred years. So when it rained, it rained. It was not just a little drizzle. Yeah, I, remember, I remember that. Yeah. And it turns into like a icky lake bed. <laughs> you just pulled the water out of a lake and it's all ooky, spooky. It wasn't very deep, but it was no. a lot of water. Yes. Um, we move forward, uh, an engagement here, an engagement there, and a lot of outposts. Uh, they had these poor people, and these were, pardon my language, but these were senior citizen types. Like, just grab the guy and stick him out there. These they were long in the tooth, and they have them out there all by themselves, isolated, with no food, water, and they're, they're just popping up like ants as we move through. So what do we do? We have to give them MREs and water. Well, they're, sur they're surrendering. They're just giving up. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. So the, the resistance was, was limited at this point. Yeah, the first day, absolutely. The first day of movement. But, but you didn't know that. No, I mean, you didn't exactly. know what was going to happen. So exactly. surrendering, yeah. Yes. And we were moving uh, almost true north at this time. So we're about a 360, 355 azimuth going straight up. Uh, two days of that, we hit a, a couple pockets, if you will. There were some vehicles. Uh, there was some movement. It was sporadic. Each of the troop, and that was uh, the, the first night, the 24th, was a, I saw my first uh, KIA types who had succumbed to small arms fire. A Iraqis. En enemy KIA. Iraqis, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And I watched our medical folk do their thing. And we had a wonderful um, platoon leader, medical platoon leader. And he was, he, and they had the blue chem lights. I'd never seen blue chem lights before. It was high, kind of awkward, mm -hmm. like blue. And they were inside the camo net. And they're piecing these people together, and I'm like, wow, our guys are good. Mesh. Okay, so you were saying that the, uh, the American medics were actually treating uh, as they could some of the Iraqi soldier oh, casualties. They were saving lives. Yep. Uh, throughout the event, what I can, what I can share with everyone, uh, the compassion and the professionalism of our, our troops, <clears throat> uh, unbelievable level of of dedication and, and uh, supreme results. We were in contact several times. Ammunition is flying both ways. Uh, the event uh, succumbs to whatever. And immediately, immediately, the, the young men from our units, they're, 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 you know, they're jumping off their vehicles, they're doing first aid, they're patching up people, like, wow. Just 30 seconds prior, they're pulling the trigger. Yeah. To see that, yeah. to see that, the impact of that, not just mowing people down and keep going. No, it's, you, you got to do first aid. That's, sure. that's our job. Five S's. Um, 
we, we move through, we move through, uh, we turn 90 degrees on the morning of the 26th, 26 Feb. They turned us 90 degrees due east. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to go east now. Easy to look, you know, and the sun's coming up. I know where I'm going. <laughs> and that day was another rainy, herky-jerk day. Um, then we got hit with this sandstorm in the middle of the afternoon. It just out of nowhere because of the temperature change and the, yeah. the, 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 um, the humidity or whatever, the precipitation stopping. They said, okay, let's turn on this vacuum cleaner, shake out the vacuum bag and hit a blow dryer with it. I'm like, what is this? Yeah. It was really luck. They had to ground the birds. I remember that because usually we had, you know, Apaches and others, you know, skimming forward and they would give good spot reports. But on this afternoon, the 26th, the, the birds were grounded because of the wind and the dust. So we're moving kind of blind. We did not know that what was in front of us, it was a heavy concentration. We didn't know there was a road actually running perfectly east-west, a paved road that the Iraqis had built for resupply. Um, we, went, we were in our standard diamond, and then early, or just after 4 o'clock, we were told to change formation, or they were going to dig us in. They sent the engineers out, start digging in. And we're like, what? Digging in? They're, they're not moving. You know what I mean? They're not going to come after us. They don't know we're here yet. But all this confusion and orders and, okay, move, go. Time now. So right at 4 o'clock, we start moving forward, but they changed our formation to Eagle Troop, go over here, right front, Ghost Troop, go over here, left front, and put Fox Troop and the tank company in behind. So we're in this smaller rectangular formation, very narrow. We were huge before, we were spread out, good distance. Third Squadron is to the south, I believe it was I Troop right here, directly next to us. And then um, it was uh, the CAV from 3rd Armored Division. 3-8 CAV, I'm going to say, I'm going to forget it. But there was a cavalry unit from the 3rd Armored to the far left. It, it happened so quickly and so devastating. And the images are, are difficult to try to share. But imagine um, black and orange fireballs. That's the way it, but that's, yeah, a black and orange fireball just rolling skyward. You see this pulse on the ground level, black and orange smoke and fire, and it just rises up. The entire horizon doing that at the same time. The, the tanks had cut, cut through this uh, uh, supply depot thing. They torched it. There was a few casualties and a few prisoners. I policed them up, got them ready to transport back to the rear. The cav, our, 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 our troop changed how we operated. The tanks went in the front with the Bradleys coming directly behind them. So we're in like a, a wedge formation, nine tanks, and then there's 12 Bradleys stuck in here with two Bradleys uh, trying to communicate with these guys. We stopped talking to Ghost Troop for some reason at that point. I remember it was just wide open area. They assaulted the position, an intense, intense tracer fire, fireballs, fireballs, fireballs. We moved past and we set up a, a, a halt. Uh, we were told to stop at a certain line. We didn't. We traveled through. <laughs> HR got his butt picked. Um, tell him I'm in contact. Sorry. <laughs> Serious. That's what he said. I'm busy. Yeah, that's what the XO. John, John Gifford, the troop XO, was a pleasant gentleman. Uh, Giff was just such a calm demeanor. And Roger. <laughs> so, you know, we get forward. We set up in a logger, which is a big circle, you know. We have tanks in the front and the Bradleys around the side. And there's still stuff flying left and right, small arms. There's a lot of secondaries, vehicles detonating, the ammo cooking off. This is an Iraqi supply. No, though. this is an Iraqi, this is a brigade defensive position. Okay. Lots of equipment. You already hit the supply thing. Now we, that was squished. That was yeah. okay. These are the actual tanks and BMPs and okay. lots of infantry. Um, we're in this logger and the sun is starting to come down. It's misty rain and now the wind thing had stopped. It was so weird. The wind blew for like 20 minutes with that nasty sand. And, you know, yeah. and, and when, it, when it mixes with the rain, you get hit with flying mud clods, you know. They hurt. Yeah. <laughs> you got nothing to protect your face with. Um, I, I drove over to HR, and he jumps on the back deck. And he looks at me and did the hug, and he goes, 
casualties? I said, no, not me, you. He goes, no. He did the hug thing. He's like, I'm hungry. Oh, okay, I give him an MRE. <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah. Casualties? No. You? No, I got no casualties. Well, how about your entire uh, unit? Were there casualties across the unit? On, on adjacent units, yes. Some of the other um, yes. troops. I troop, uh, Ghost Troop had a Bradley destroyed, lost a crewman. Uh, he was a good kid, Sergeant Muller. Um, yes, uh, across the front there were people hit, but w what we were able to do, and I mean the Guardian Angel, enormous Guardian Angel, we hit a unit that was, you know the uh, calculation there of uh, a ratio of forces? We don't attack unless it's three to one. That's doctrine. Three, three our favor, one of them. What we did that afternoon was 32 to 1 in their favor. Wow. How that, and we walked away without a scratch. And they were gone. Okay. We scraped together 42 prisoners that night. 42. And the artillery strike was in Armageddon strike. There were 72 uh, 155 guns in a line running north to south. And at the very northern tip was a battalion of MLRS rocket pots. And they were all firing in depth at the basic same location. You, could, you couldn't you could walk. It was like walking on a timpani drum. You were wiggling and vibrating from the tremble of the earth from the impact. And that was two Ks away. Yeah. So that when you mentioned before the explosions, that was the explosions from the artillery? No, no. That was our tanks hitting their tanks. Okay. Killing everything. Yeah. This happened. The artillery strike didn't start until the... the it lasted for like two hours. It was horrible. It looked like somebody lit a sprinkler and laid it on the ground and just sprinkle, sprinkle, sparkle, sparkle. DPICM going yeah. off. Well, was that your last uh, major engagement or did you have a few more after that? We did the passage of lines that night and uh, very, very, very small one, onesie, twosie things as we moved further east after that because all the, the, the heavy divisions went through it. Went through right, okay. It. At this point, the night of 26 Feb, you had 1st ID, 3rd Armored, 1st Armored, 1st Cav, and the British to the far right. Yeah, everybody came through. Some Marines were around too. Uh, not not, not, not necessarily where you were. But yeah, yeah, the Brit yeah, they yeah. came up through Kuwait City. Yeah. Okay. So this is now towards the, the, the later stage of the 100 Hour War. Yes. Uh, passage of Lines. What was your role then after that? Uh, to uh, give aid to the wounded. So, you know, the en enemy wounded for yes. the most part. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, oh, yes. And then, as I recall, too, there were tremendous numbers of people surrendering or that had surrendered. That, that happened earlier, back. though. Yeah. yeah. That happened earlier. Yeah. I didn't see a lot. We didn't see a lot after that whatsoever. Okay. 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 Each is. But like when you had that engagement with the, uh, the brigade size element, was that a more disciplined force, do you think? Uh, yeah, very much so. Republican Guard. Very, they were, that was the Telequana oh. division. Okay, so that was one of their best units. They actually probably tried oh, to Those put were up T-72s up, and they ran. Up, tried to put up a fight. Oh, very much so. Some of the other guys very on, much on so. the fringes were um, draft, well, draftees or just ready to surrender. Correct. Yeah, okay. These, well, <clears throat> allow me please, the, the following morning, 27th, uh, again, misty rain, horrible viz. Uh, we received the message that a uh, A-10 had destroyed a British warrior. And a warrior looks a little bit like a Bradley. It's an oblong fighting vehicle with a little turret on it. It had destroyed the warrior. And I had received sniper fire, and I took a couple Bradleys with me and the doc, the 113 with the medic. And we did a sweep of these bunkers. And we did, you know, bunker to bunker, throw a grenade in, fire in the hole, just swept. Were you dismounted this Yes, yeah, both. Dismount. I was on... I was using my 50 when I had to, or we'd use M16. Some guys were, okay. Some yes. guys were out dismounting. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, what, what are you doing sniping at us? You just got your butt kicked. Now you're going to start sniping in the morning? Really? So I remember hearing that distinctive wine grindy noise that A-10s make. You know, it's not, they have that... Uh, 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 Their uh, engine. Uh, the engines. Uh, it's, it's a jet engine, but it has... A, uh, like it's that strain all the time, you know? It's under, under load. And I told everybody, freeze, freeze, freeze. Make sure you got your aerial panel markers up because we're nested in, forget it, literally hundreds of pieces of equipment that's brown or sand colored and they don't have aerial panel markers on them. A lot of them are destroyed, the vehicles. But our vehicles are live, pretty vehicles and we have the, the big pink, orange, 
Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Strung across yeah. the top of the vehicle, and over time, with the wind and movement, and you throw a box of ammo, and the next thing you know, it's not not visible. No, make it visible. Anyway, we we swept some prisoners. We collected some prisoners. The the doc, the Sergeant E5 medic of our unit, capable young man from North Texas. And we put his dip up, up in the upper lip. <laughs> it, was so, it was so awkward looking. He had his dip up here. And it looked like he was sticking his tongue out and all the time. <laughs> but yeah. it was his dip. He was patching together a couple casualties by himself in the back of his 113. We had about 30, 40 prisoners that were doing the pat down, checking for weapons and, and materials. And I'm watching his ramp to my left about 10 feet away. And I'm on the ground, no helmet, just my M16, and I'm going between vehicles and people. What are we doing? The, uh, the casualty that he was working on had a very, very catastrophic head wound. And he was literally like a puzzle, putting pieces back, with his little rubber gloves on, had the, so the, the Iraqi soldier in his lap, with his body out there, and he was, you know, patching him up, best he could. The guy was still alive, okay. There was another wounded uh, Iraqi who had been shot or something in the leg, who was, you know, on the floor of the vehicle. And this guy wants to be Joe Hero. So he grabs a, a big hypodermic, and he's going to stab Doc and get away. Where are you going to go? But I'm, I'm watching this from 10, 15 feet away, and I'm like, the kid has got a casualty with a skull in his head, and he's, and he's still got his dip in there. <laughs> he, he saw out of the corner of his eye the other prisoner trying to make the move, and I swear, without missing a beat, he took his M16, poof, caught him right in the upper lip, knocked him out, puts the M16 back, spits in his can, looks at me, wings, and keeps going. Ugh. Is that amazing? The, <laughs> you, you can't repeat, re you cannot repeat, yeah, yeah. re Mr. King, or you know, Mr. Uh, Stephen, what's his name? Uh, the, the movie guy, he couldn't recre recreate oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well then, uh, fast forward to coming back home to, to redeploying out. Okay. What was that like? I was herky-jerky. It was awkward. Um, you can fly this day, no, you can fly that day. You can fly this day, no, you can fly that day. So we went through that nonsense. Kind of, <clears throat> it was good experience for the guys because they were able to decompress. Uh, the chaplain was able to start the, I don't want to say therapy, but <laughs> start, uh, cons you know, counseling folks. You know, be, be patient with your families. You know, you've been away for was several this, months. Was this March? What time frame was uh, this? April. It's now April. April you guys. Yeah. Okay. We were there a little over four and a half months on the ground. We had to leave a few folks behind for the equipment sure, to get loaded sure. up to come back. So April. Yes. Yeah, okay. The uh, Yusuf commander, Crosby said, said, no brown vehicles allowed in Germany. <laughs> I think you might remember that. Well, yeah. Oh, you were first cast. I was in first Texas. cast. So <laughs> we uh, had to paint everything OD green again. <laughs> we couldn't do the camel because we didn't have enough colors, but we... Couldn't bring brown vehicles back. We had to paint everything flat OD green before they would load them on a boat. That was a, an obstacle. Mm -hmm. We redeployed to uh, Europe, did the reunion stuff. Uh, we turned around and trained for gunnery. And I, I must say at this point, our squadron, I still have the score sheet that 7th Corps provided, or 5th Corps provided, I'm sorry. We had higher scores with our tank and Bradley gunnery after we returned from the, the Gulf War, with all different crew combinations, yeah. which is bizarre. Yeah. It's so bizarre. Yeah. The tank commander or the gunner are different. Yeah. They're not the same team. The scores were off the charts. The Bradleys, the Bradley fighting vehicle used to fly, fire um, burst on target. So you fire one round, see where it hits, then you fire two, then you fire three to finish the, the engagement. Yeah. So you're given six bullets with the 25. Every one of our Bradleys shot a thousand, perfect score with a different Bradley commander and a different gunner. Wow. Who does that? Yeah. Um, going back for a second while you were still deployed, mm -hmm. did, um, how did you stay in contact with uh, family and friends, loved ones back in, in Germany or in the US? Thank you. Um, the snail mail was the lifeline. And many an adventure took place with the mail. I remember all those wonderful any soldier mail letters and when I would get them, I would ask the platoon sergeants, because I had to be the collector of the mail, both in and out. Um, I'm like, oh, so who hasn't gotten anything in a while? And they'd give me the names of the kids, soldiers in their platoons, who hadn't received anything. So I would make sure they got the first opportunity to read one of those. Long story short, I made them 
right back. It was free. Just envelope yeah, for, and free a letter. Now, yeah. Yes. So of our 126 person organic unit, three guys ended up marrying yeah. from that relationship. Um, yeah. to, that was so incredible. That's a good story. I yeah. made them write the return letter. Oh, Tom, I ain't got time. They had time to write you. Just take 30 seconds. Say, thank you for your note. Wish you well. Happy New Year. Blah, blah, blah. Go. Whatever. So, but the, the, uh, the contact with back, because you didn't have phones. We didn't have a cell yeah, phone. Most of the, most of the, any soldier mail was women. Most of it. I mean, there were some and kids. Other, and lots kids, of kids. kids yeah, short kids. But I remember a lot of women. And yes. Some of them were older women. You know, grandma, Indeed. Grandma, but there were some young women, too. And they would Indeed. send photos. And, and uh, I know you guys were really busy. You were only there for four months. But were there any recreation or free time opportunities? And what did you guys do? Only the last few days while we were at the port prior to redeploying, uh, we called it Wally World. I have no idea where that name came from. I think it's from the Griswold movie. Yeah. Wally World yeah. Yeah. <laughs> had some fitness equipment Arnold had donated so we got to play with Arnold weights uh, the Marines had occupied this uh, supply depot thing it was part of that massive uh, BP we're in the same place back in Jabba, Al Jabba so it was where the, the contract workers for the oil fields had had their little area there were a couple of uh, concrete buildings structures where you could go inside and in air conditioning and it's like are you kidding this is awesome and <laughs> sit down at a at a, a stuffed chair and like wow and read a magazine inside a stuffed yeah, chair in yeah. a, a building. At first, it was awkward to go inside a building because we'd been outside in our vehicles for so long. And it just it, you felt claustrophobic real quick, you know, because there's a roof now and there's walls. Ew. Yeah. So the guys had to adjust from that. And then uh, speaking of your, of your thinking of your Desert Storm time, Desert Shield time, um, did you personally receive any any awards? And if so, what? Or if you want to talk more about unit level awards that your unit might have gotten for the campaign? The, uh, the awards were mixed. Uh, I did receive an award. Um, H I still have the write-up from HR. It is incredibly humbling the way he wrote it up. You know, we had to write a, a narrative, right. essentially, back then. Um, so several, I would say several, uh, were not were not given justification for what they didn't receive what they should have received, like an ARCOM with a V. I mean, come on, these are kids that are jumping out of fighting vehicles, crawling through the dirt, fighting, you know, spraying weapons, and then pulling first aid on casualties and saving lives. We couldn't get them an ARCOM with a V because of the quota. So that was a sticking point for us for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so that was a, uh, a very fascinating and detailed story about the Desert Shield, Desert Store time. And so I think we may jump around a little bit. I noticed here, and you mentioned to me before, Bill, about that you ended up serving in, in, in Bosnia, correct? Correct. Yeah, so kind of maybe back up a little bit of what unit you were in, what your rank and role was, and then how you ended up in Bosnia. Uh, yes. Uh, real quick, after the Gulf, I uh, got reassigned to Fort Knox. And I was able to, um, wonderful job, an incredible job, a privilege as a senior NCO. I was the first sergeant for the Armor Officer Basic Course for a little over a year. And what that entails, you get all these brand new lieutenants fresh from the academy and or uh, university. And this is their first real active integration into their career field of armor and cavalry. Uh, such the wonderful time and it was we averaged oh my gosh anywhere from six to eight hundred on hand the in the inventory of students the classes because they were at least 120 per class and we'd have at least five classes rolling at the same time based on the schedule to get them into the field so I was able to impart a lot of the the core values of that relationship with uh, the young officer and their their NCO in, in, in a very dis, um, no, it's a good word I wanted to use here, in a, a, a relaxed forum, if you will, not this, you will do this because of that and you're going to do, no, no, no. But to let these kids understand, you know, the value of that NCO that they're going to be working with. Go into the job knowing that, okay, he's got 10, 12, 14, 15 years of doing this life, okay. Is he the smartest? knife in the drawer? 
or sharp as knife? No, but he has those years. Okay, pull that out of the guy. You know, don't make that. I'm the lieutenant. I'm in charge. That's that's a given. Say, I'm, I'm here to do the right thing. Show me how to get there. And the the bonding of those kids with those NCOs paid back multiple. Because I ran into them later in life. Um, then I was selected to work at Department of the Army, Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah. Perscom, uh, enlisted personnel management. Uh, for at, for, 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 for night, CMF 19. Yeah. That was a great job. And here comes Fred Franks again. So were you, were you a sergeant major at this? Time? I was a master sergeant. Master sergeant. Okay. Yeah. The, okay. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. The job is an yeah. E8 slot. Um, I had such a wonderful crew to work with. Had a handful of uh, government civilians, and then I had a hand, uh, several NCOs, and then we had a branch officer in charge. And our division chief was a Eadrang Valley veteran. I have such respect for this gentleman. I mean, he wasn't part of Hal Moore's battalion, but he's part of the relief. So, you know, he, he was there when it was still touching going. Anyway, we had such a great relationship. We set this uh, a new paradigm that uh, took away a lot of the, I would say, bad blood that existed from branch with the field. And, if, and, then, so, and this was at a time where we had a little bit of a drawdown in the early 90s, mid-90s, and you had... Um, a, you mentioned earlier yourself where it was take the, the folks with the uh, field experience, the, the, the technical aspects, and put them into the, uh, the training environment. But we went even a step further. That was for the uh, universities, the ROTC. Right. But then we also had a lot of active component, reserve component. Um, ACRC. Yes. And the guys who had to do that job had to have a set of criteria to qualify for the job. So I made it very simple. Criteria, they go. No criteria, they don't go. And my, my other, the two Sergeant First Class, I had one for scouts, one for tankers. They, they were very, they, they both made Sergeant Major, so that answers that. They're superb humans, they understood it, and we had a good relationship. A unit would call, or a, uh, a leader would call from an armored unit somewhere. Hey, I need you to put Sergeant First Class so-and-so over here. And we would look at his record. There's no extenuating circumstance. There's no uh, family, exceptional family member. None of that, none of that. He just wanted them to go there as my bud. And we're like, it doesn't qualify. What do you mean it doesn't qualify? You don't understand he doesn't qualify. Well, I'm going to call so-and-so. Roger, it's your option. It's your privilege. Have a nice day. So this, it would escalate, escalate, escalate. Hence, Timothy Mott. So he was our EPMD, one star at this time. And the branch chief, as I mentioned, the Ia Drang Valley Army, uh, Infantry Colonel, he would come over to me and go, man, what are you doing to me? I go, what do you mean, sir? What do you mean? He doesn't qualify. Okay, show me. I show him. Okay, he doesn't qualify. Then, then he would be my advocate. I'd go to the one star because he had to respond to some flag officer somewhere why this master, insolent master sergeant is not assigning his NCO. He doesn't qualify. No, he doesn't qualify. And the subject, done. So... It worked. I had so a lot General of General Ma backed you up. Oh, all those big things. time. And these big were time. these were cases where people wanted to get their soldiers. Yes. The ACRC. These are info no no not, not so much ACRC, but it, was, right. that, anyway. it was that coercion or influence whatever, that, thing. Oh, whatever the assignment was. Okay. Yes, okay. Okay. yeah. Okay. A special job. Well, how did that lead to uh, your getting to Bosnia though? Oh, um, I, I got I got promoted. It was ridiculous. Because, you know, I, I had never served in Korea, and I wanted to do the Korean tour. Sure. So I put myself on orders for Korea. I'm going to Korea. I never served at Hood either. So I said, I'm going to go to Korea with a return assignment to Hood. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the home base. Yeah, uh, as, yeah. A, as a E8. Oh, no, sorry. You get, I got promoted real fast to E9. So I go to the academy, and I, I you know, I incensed every significant armored leader to include Fred Franks because he was trade op commander at the time, and he had a Sergeant First Class approach him from some previous experience wanting to work in the military district of Washington. And there was no exceptional family member, no compassionate reassignment criteria. Put him in the old guard. We don't have jobs for scouts in the old guard. But put him there anyway. No. And his aide called me, the, the 05, 06, whatever he was at the time, for the four star. Hey, uh, the general's uh, kind of upset you're not going to take care of him. I said, he, he doesn't qualify? Am I going to set a new... No, I'm not going to violate my integrity. I love General Franks, but no. 
A few minutes later, the phone rings again. It's him. He's like, come on, Top. You can help me out here. Sir, he doesn't qualify. He doesn't. The best we can do is this. Right? And then after I gave all the, you know, he came back and said, do it. So this is the old man coming through. I mean, it was so wonderful. You know what I mean? And he'll remind me of that when we chat. He goes, you know, you did stick it to me with that so-and-so. I said, no, gave I, him an alternative. I gave was, him an alternative. It was, it was pretty good. It which was almost as good. Well, well, everybody wins. The yeah. unit, the soldier. So I go to the academy. What happens? Uh, I get tagged CSM. Straight out of the academy. Guess where I'm going? Second squadron, second ACR. Going back home. Yeah. Which I've been with yeah. multiple times. Yeah. Ghost yeah. Troop, Eagle Troop. I've become the quite... Uh, well, actually, let's, uh, I'm going to move the camera up. And uh, you pointed, just tell us what you were pointing at up there. And Pride wanted, and joy. You want to describe that for somebody who maybe doesn't know? Um, well, this is the guide on for the squadron. Yeah. Um, a squadron is equal to a battalion, maybe a little bigger in the total manning. Those are the, the regimental colors up there. Okay. That's our traditional. And this was presented to you then, it oh, looks yeah. like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And well, while we're doing it, what uh, what do you got? Why don't you tell us what is over here? Well, the second armor cavalry. And you can, that's you can, our... you can feel, feel free to stand up if you'd Thank like you. to. And, uh... So this represents uh, the, the tradition of the second armor cavalry when it was founded. Okay. And some of his exploits. On the other side, you have the first. Squadron First Cavalry, which was my first um, unit of assignment in Europe against uh, what we okay. call Freedom's Frontier. Excellent. And anything over here? Well, this represents the 150th for the regiment. Again, 2nd ACR. I was privileged to be working at... John Tololi was regimental commander okay. at this point in time. Um, that was given to me after Bosnia. Uh, spurs, got lots of spurs. You get spurred a lot if okay. you do good in the cab. Order of the spurs. <laughs> yes. Um, my, my very good friend, Mark Little, uh, he retired uh, out in uh, the Fort, or not the Fort Hood area, Dallas area, Arlington. We served together in Bosnia. Okay. He's a wonderful human being. And then uh, what's the significance of the painting there? This too? was just a gift from uh, the guys at Armor Branch. Okay. But that was your D, uh, HRC assignment, yeah? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, well, let's uh, put you back in the chair. Take me a second as I refocus. But so now you've, you've made uh, CSM and you're getting assigned to, where'd you go there? Oh, Jared. Oh, you said, I'm second sorry, you ACR. went to the second ACR, yeah. At the time, they had uh, relocated from Fort Lewis down to uh, Fort Polk, JRTC. They had done a deployment to Haiti under the UN, kind of harsh conditions, poor guys. Now, that was a very awkward police keeping type of uh, activity for them. Did you go for that too? Or no, not? I was at the Department of the Army okay, at yeah, this point, yeah. early, mid-90s working. Well, so what was it like going into Bosnia? That was really, um, as I mentioned, I was on the border for almost nine years of my life, East Germany and all that. So to walk in a ground that belonged to the commies was awkward. And obviously seeing all their old equipment still in in use it was awkward it was unpleasant it was like mm, untrustworthy so we we we, uh, we first landed in uh, hungary and then we had to road march or fly into depending on our you know uh, cap what was available uh back into uh tuzla so I, I was able to fly into tuzla we um had a huge sector of my squadron at the time 850 square miles of uh, terrain, and it was primarily centered on what was called the zone of separation. Everything has to, every acronym city, acronym soup in the military. The ZOS, zone of separation. What the ZOS meant? Did you participate? Um, it was a two thousand meter, like DMZ, that ran basically northwest, southeast across the country, and a, a lot of the area had the Drina River as another physical barrier, but it was inside the Zoss itself. The river wasn't the Zoss, it was at 2,000 meters. Long story short, so the Serbs were on one side, the Muslims and the Croatians were on the other side. <laughs> and that event uh, was one of the more uh, eye-opening, educational, uh, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching uh, operations we ever did, but we had significant success. 
And what year was paradigms. this, though? What year was this? 97, 98. Okay. And we, how long were you there for? Uh, I wasn't there the entire time. I, I got medevaced. But uh, the unit was there from summer of 97 through summer of 98. Yeah, but so at this point, I mean, and if you could tell us, it was still kind of a... Uh, wasn't necessarily a wartime environment, but there was stuff going on. Indeed. That I think a lot of the American public has no idea what was really going on. There. Thank you. I'm very glad you brought that out. The atrocities, that was what I said it was very heart-wrenching. The atrocities committed by two of the three, let's say, uh, antagonists in this uh, environment. It, it was so hard for the kids, my, my young soldiers, the 19-year-old scouts, to, to grasp why are they seeing such a vicious, violent result that it just didn't, it didn't measure, it didn't reach the sanity scale for these kids because they hate each other so bad. They just hate each other so bad. They won't give up. So they would behead someone, a leader of a family, and they'd put the head on a stake in the front yard and turn the body upside down and just leave it there. And obviously, you know, you're going to see that. And back and forth between two of the three, as I mentioned. We, uh, there were sniping events, uh, there were constant, constant, oh, the terrible mine strikes. And that just tears you up because they're innocent, they're out there looking for firewood, okay? Yeah, well, if, if you could cover that a little yeah. bit. I mean, that, that, the whole area was just mined indiscriminately, as In, I recall. Thank you. A precise term indiscriminately to the point <clears throat> they would take a box a case of anti-personnel mines arm the mine dump it and let it roll down the side of a hill yeah and they, they the soil over there is incredibly porous so they, it wouldn't take long for the soil to absorb those munitions there would be two three inches under the ground before you know it right and innocent innocent people they're out there looking for firewood they're going home they're going to go pick berries they stumble on it and their life. Well, so what was, for you personally, what were your day-to-day -day duties while you were there? Um, as, the, as the CSM, uh, we were large. We were 1,200 uh, 1, people. We had our two base camps and we had six uh, outposts that were like on mountaintops and main intersections. So we would, you know, control the flow and intercept contraband and uh, keeping up the morale. Constantly... Um, I, I, when I could, because you had the, the four vehicle rule, which is kind of hard to manage, you know, you have to have four vehicles and you need the whole march order and you need all the reaction and all the planning and the detailing go into it and, and your uh, quick reaction force and all that stuff has to be tied in. And we didn't have enough helicopters to fly everywhere. Well, it's a pretty tough terrain, right? Incredibly hilly terrain. Right. Beautiful to look at, just like upstate New York or Vermont or something, rolling and pretty. Um, I would make site visits uh, to the units, and I would do like housekeeping chores. I would bring the reenlistment NCO, and I would bring the uh, equal opportunity NCO. With yeah, okay. So they got uh, the, the guys got to talk. They could speak freely when, when they had those uh, those few minutes at like lunchtime uh, in the little tiny uh, mess hall we would have. So our reenlistment rate stayed really strong because the guys were able to, if they really wanted to, they could do it. And then we were able to work through some other uh, administrative ugliness that was going on. Pay was a pain in the butt back then because you were assigned, you know, hostile fire pay and this and separation pay and all that. And it always gets, it falls through the cracks. So we had that um, constant sure. flow. Being able to um, take leaders with me from the unit out to these outposts was another critical in my mind, uh, function I had to I had to do. So I would bring a first sergeant and or the commander and put them in my convoy because they, they couldn't build their own convoy. You know what I mean? They didn't yeah. have that authority. Yeah. So they, they were so appreciative of that and it became a routine. Once a month, I would take all the first sergeants and we would do the sweep. We would go to all the main outposts and compounds and they got to visit their troops. Really, really, and of course, like I said, the EO, NCO and the retention NCO came. Yeah. And it became such a wonderful pattern for these guys. They got into a rhythm. And there was something I, I did that stirred the pot and really infuriated some folk. But I immediately understood why the guys were doing what they're doing. You had people 
what they call accidental discharge. It's not accidental. They pulled the trigger for a purpose. So they were firing their rounds off the their towers in the middle of the night. Our guys, American our, guys. our guys, yes. Yeah. Just frustrated, bored, whatever. They would fire the round. They said they saw something hostile. They'd fire the round. But they were actually killing dogs or something. Long story short, I I, I told the old man, Mark Little, I said, I, I want to put um, on Sundays only. I said, let's reduce to 25% up tempo and let the kids or the folks that are on duty put on their PT uniform. You have to carry your weapon with you at all time. All that, that's okay. But just to take a, a, a sense of, I'm not, in, I'm, not, I'm not involved at this moment. I can relax. I mean, really relax. Sneakers, yeah. PT gear, you know. I swear to you, the, the transition was so vibrant across the unit. Um, it infuriated the uh, other leaders at a, a different level who said, how dare you? You have no right to do that. Yes, I do. I don't work for you. These are my guys. Have a nice day. <laughs> yes, your, your sector, your, your, yes, your, your, your yes. towers, your stations. And places. other, other uh, leaders at my level saw what I was doing and like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> it changed the paradigm. There were no more rounds flying around. Uh, there was, you didn't have the uh, physical, hello, I don't like you. Because oh. the stress build up between people. Because yeah. if you're constantly, uh, you know, under arms, constantly, constantly, in, you know, preparing to engage, preparing to engage, they didn't have that mental uh, pause button. Like, I don't have to engage. Yeah, so did you actually have <clears throat> incidents where, where you or some of your soldiers were um, either intentionally or unintentionally under fire from, yes. from one of the opposing oh, yeah. sides? They ambushed yeah. us a few yeah. times. Yeah. And... In intentionally targeting the US yes. Oh, it was okay. oh yeah. Okay. They created. You gotta give them credit. They they created some weaponry that is really scary. They had some seven six seven point six two ammo that was ex ex exceptionally long, the casing, and they built a special uh, rifle. They had a right a sniper rifle. You could shoot nine thousand meters. Who does that? Yeah. So they would sit on a, a hilltop. And they would wait for the opportune moment to fire that weapon into the center of the village to uh, attack a, an opposing leader of some kind. But attack you? Necessarily. No, no, no. The U.S. or no, this was those. Was those were the, the thirty factions. The, the faction-driven okay. nonsense. How about how about attacks on the U.S. forces though? We had uh, occasional ambushes out in remote area. Again, we moved in four vehicle convoys, yeah, yeah. and we we had ample firepower to return. And their, all of their main equipment, their tanks, their uh, heavy weaponry, was all put into an armory. And we had to, you know, spot check all the time, random, go to this one, go to that one, lay everything out just like you would a, a unit. All right, how many rounds of 50 cal do you have? How many sure, rounds of sure. So the, the control on them was pretty tight, but you had those underground, rebellious, criminal elements still out there. Well, so thinking... Uh from your time there in, in Bosnia, what, what was probably the most rewarding experience, either with the local nationals from the host country or positive experience with your U.S. soldiers? Uh, the, the most positive. Yeah, of course. We, uh, Mark Little, God bless him. His sister was a principal or superintendent somewhere back in northern New Jersey, Paramus, or not Paramus, Parsippany, Parsippany area, I guess. And... Each and every time we were able to open up a new school for them or just visit, because we had to do these key leader engagements in, in the villages around, uh, the school conditions were incredibly, incredibly despondent. I mean, to the point of they had to cut a hole in the floor for the kids to go to the bathroom in the room, and they took a bucket and rinse it. So aside from that, they didn't have any materials, books, paper, chalk, you name it. So Mark sent an email, because we had email back then, it was working, Yahoo. He uh, contacted his sister and said, hey, if you could scratch some supplies together, it'd be really good. Okay, so what do they do? Good, generous Americans, Christian folk, they boxed up a bunch of stuff and they sent it to us. So the initial round, we had a lot of pencils, erasers, you know, the, the just the basics, notepads, chalk, erasers. Um, and then we delivered it to a place that we knew was in a, in a need because we were constantly in, interacting that way. Oh, let, me, let me caveat this. The folks that were complying with the Dayton Accord, 
whereby no animosity, no th they weren't threatening, they weren't doing things, contraband. They were receiving funding and infrastructure were being rebuilt. Schools, roads, stores, churches, whatever. Those who continued to violate Dayton didn't get the coin. They let it earn quickly. Don't do bad, you get coin. But that other stuff was way, way behind. That was not in the priority whatsoever, given you know, the school supplies. So we, had to, we ended up with this Operation Chalkboard. That's what I named it. It, it worked out so incredible. Gotta have, Army, Army operations got to have a name. It's got to have an operation. But you, you'll appreciate when you said, you know, gratifying. We got a couple boxes of supplies. So what do we do? We break it down evenly. So many of these, 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 and these. And we go to a site visit that had a school or a key leader visit engagement. And the American stormtrooper, because that's what they called us on the contraband radio, the stormtroopers occupying our country. The soldier with the Kevlar and the flak jacket and the weapon took the box of pencils and erasers and chalk and handed them to the child. And the look on the face of the seven, eight, nine year old little kid, it's for me? Yeah, it's for you. And it's American with the flag on the uniform, giving it to me. Yeah. That's right. The American with the flag, out of his own heart, gave it to you. Uh, Jay, we got such a stimulus from that region that it grew out of the proportion. I had to give stuff to other units because we had too much. Oh, to give so they could do the same thing. The stuff that yeah. was coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I had to get a 40-foot truck van empty, and we had to build compartments. I had to assign soldiers. I, I usually took kids that were not doing well. You know, they had a, a physical malady. You know, they tore up their yeah. ankle or something. So I'd have three or four soldiers on a daily basis, inventorying, stacking, you know, getting everything ready to go for the next shipment to go out. It grew into this daily project that had a... And this was stuff that was just donated by Donated by, by good-hearted people in, back in America, in America in, a, in a small area. Yeah. New York, New Jersey, PA, that yeah, little tri-state. I had I'd not heard about that, because you always hear about people, you were talking about the any soldier mail or the yes. packages sent to soldiers, mm -hmm. but here was a case of them sending stuff for the local population to Indeed. support them. Well, any other, uh, as we kind of get closer to the end here, any other specific Bosnia uh, uh, things that stand out to you that you want to share? <clears throat> oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I did something I, I shouldn't have, and uh, I accepted the consequences, and it, it didn't backfire on me. But we had, the entire theater had a limitless supply of these donuts. And they were the good cake donuts, heavy duty, with the, the, the cinnamon or the white powder on yeah. them, or the plain, right? And they were eight to a box. And they were cooked, they were baked for us. They were baked strictly for S4. European allies, everybody, we had them. And they were on every table in the, the, the defect. We had like 30, our, our main camp had a and huge... Baked, baked, baked locally there. They by, were baked locally. By, by yes. uh, U.S. or S4? No, or S4, S4, or S4. Yeah, yeah, the contract, the contract okay. kitchen. Yeah, 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 wow. And, uh, you know, I, I did a service to my soldiers. I, you know, helped them with their weight control. Um, one morning I, in, the, in the fall, I said, you know what, this is, this is going to work. So I told my driver, and at first I asked the, uh, the, the chief of the, the, the kitchen, I said, am I, am I going to violate anything if I take a few of these with me when I go out? No, sir, Major, we got plenty, all you need. So we would take a box with about, I don't know, six or eight of those packages with like eight of them in there, you know, the full size, and we'd carry them in our Hummer. And when we were in a movement, if, if the opportunity presented itself, I would call short haul and give them to the kids that were waiting on the side of the road. Yeah. So we're not supposed to do that, but tough. I swear to you, Jay, the, the gratification from doing that, to see the look on these kids, again, stormtroopers, helmets, guns, trucks, flag, here, this is a gift for you. I, I remember, I, I can't remember exact words, and I used to be able to speak a little Bosnian, you know, Dobro Yocho, Kakoste, all that stuff, but this is for you. I say, these are for you. Uh, the first couple times the kids ran, they took off like somebody had let off a firecracker. Pew, they ran up the street, the road, but like ran away or they, they, they scattered. Yeah, no, no, they just and then ran. When we stopped the trucks, they oh, ran. Because okay. you know, a nothing, Hummer, nothing good could come of that. Yeah, yeah, because you know the Hummer is there. Blah, 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 blah. It's loud like a hot rod. Anyway, after the and there was always a chaperone there too. That was the best. There'd be a young lady in her mid twenties, you know just hanging on 
with a handful of kids waiting for a bus or something. And then it ignited after, oh my gosh, it ignited. So to this day, knowing that we were able to share just that tiny touch of humanity with those kids, and then those kids are grown-ups now, right? This is well over 20 years ago. So they're going to remember, you know, the Americans with the flag on the uniform stopped and gave us donuts yeah. or a treat. That's good. That's How does good. that happen? Well, Bill, looking uh, looking back on your, your military and specifically your wartime experiences, how do you think that affected you, though, for the rest of your life, you know, going forward, after, both in the military but then also after the military, the, your wartime perspective? Uh, the appreciation for life, the appreciation of uh, one person caring for another, uh, despite the circumstances. Like, as I mentioned, you know, you're you're in a hostile engagement, and then it stops, and then you become a, then you're the first aid person. What, what seriously? My my driver of my Bradley, this uh, robust young man from Texas as well. He turned. Oh, he killed me with the Garth Brooks music though, because <laughs> that's all he had. Because back then we had the little yeah, cassette players. Yeah. And you could plug him in so he could hear him over the, the vehicle intercom. Oh wow! So uh, you know the Thunder Road is stuck in my head. It won't go away. <laughs> but anyway, he's a wonderful kid. To watch what, 19 years old, what are you going to do with private? To see him, once we had established, you know, a sense of the moment, to jump out of the vehicle and dive on top of an Iraqi wounded guy and just start patching him. And he did it like, almost, I swear to you, and I teased him about it. I said, it's like I were rodeo in the guy. You know how they do the calf and they rip him oh, and yeah, twist him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just went after it. Such a moment. How do yeah. you how do you recreate yeah. that? Spielberg. That's what I meant to say. Steven oh, before. Steven yeah, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Spielberg. You know, with the with Doc with the with the M16 poking the guy. Poof, yeah. And you kept patching up the guy, wow. spitting his cup. Good well, people. Well, the uh, the second to last question is kind of related to what we just said. But so, if there's if there's one thing you'd want future generations and, and, and history to know, or grandkids, grandkids, great grandkids, future generations, what would you want them to know about you personally and your military service? Wow, I've never heard that. Thank you. Um, a disciplined, professional, a caring leader. Only one way to do things. And do it the right way or don't do it at all. Yeah and never lose your integrity. You can't get it back. Well, no, that's a good good perspective. Well, we're, we're down to the proverbial last question. We've covered a lot of, a lot of ground, very, very interesting, lots of detail. Um, but is there anything else that you wanted to, to cover or that or, or go back to? Or I know we, we, we actually left out some of your civilian time in Iraq and Afghanistan or some of the other incredible stuff that you did, but um, did we miss anything or anything else you wanted to hit? Um, I would like, you know, for posterity or whatever, everyone, 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 physically capable and mentally competent should wear the uniform for a short period of time in their life, whether it be a year, two years, whatever. The, the enormous benefits that you receive when you contribute, not just participate, but you contribute, your time, your energy, your passion, um, your heart, uh, changes you for life. Having witnessed all these young men as a drill sergeant, I was very young myself, I was 23 when I was started, um, having these 17, 18, 19 year old kids come up and ask you questions about, you know, what what do you recommend? How should I look at this? It's, it, it's unbelievably powerful. And no other environment, uh, I mean, law enforcement guys are tight, but it, it's, it's a smaller group. Whereas in, in the military, you're, you're part of a, a, a function, you know, to protect the national security of this land. That the, you know, the weight on those shoulders is huge. So have everyone having just a taste of that, not a commitment to life, not a career, 30 years, 20 years, whatever, but just that taste of commitment to a purpose. Unbelievable. I think, forget, forget controversy, it dissipates quickly. I think that's I think that's very well said, and I think that's a great way to uh, to wrap this up. But Bill, while we're still on camera, I'd like to oh. I'm not familiar with the challenge coins, but I'd like to shake your hand too, and uh, maybe if what you could just just hold that up. What what you have there is the challenge coin from our 
hold it up a little. Yeah, a challenge coin from our Voices of Freedom project in the American and War Times Museum. And again, Bill, it's been a it's been a pleasure hearing some of your stories here, and uh, a real honor. My privilege.